Jess, we're on. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the pre-show. My name is Rod. Good morning, and I'm Jessica. Glad to be with you. And as we're just getting started, we have some friends here in the room, uh, part of our live audience that we're glad, and people are making their way in on this snowy day. In addition to that, um, people are beginning to jump online, and we'd love for you to be able to say hi to us, whether you're watching on Facebook Live or the online campus. Uh, Please be sure to drop us a note. We have great hosts that are kind of enjoying this experience with you. That's right. Good morning to Carol, and I'm going to get over to our online campus as well. And yes, Rod, the snow is a welcome thing, right? Absolutely. So if you're tuning in from far and you have seen about Colorado fires, two of the largest in Colorado history are happening right now in our county. It's crazy. And uh, you guys like the way I'm trying to be thematic here, Jess, with my FDNY, FDNY cap in a way to kind of show support and encouragement to our uh, fire departments that are serving our community so well. In fact, um, a little bit later on as a part of our live cast, um, Ryan Howell is going to kind of challenge us with some ways we can encourage um, our local fire department. Yes, absolutely. Now, there is some really fun stuff coming up at Crossroads. Most notably, it's taking place um, this Saturday, which is our October Family Fest, and it's going to be a modified drive-through version this time, but we're collecting candy, and when we're talking about candy, what I'd love to hear, <laughs> Jess, I know you're not a candy person, but I am. You are! So I, I, my favorite of the chocolate ones, at least, are the $100,000 bar, and I'd be curious for you guys to list what's your favorite candies out there. What's your yes. favorite candy? I know you're not a candy person. I really am not a sugar. I don't okay. eat sugar. Okay, as a kid, then, as a okay, kid. Okay, as a kid, sour apple. Sour apple. Okay, if I was going to have anything, if it was going to be the color fruit stuff, it's either watermelon or sour apple. Okay, so Jolly Ranchers, those are great flavors. Yes. If it was chocolate, then chocolate peanut butter. So Reese's. Yes, or Whoppers. Whoppers. In this room, what do you guys like? Yellow favorite candies. Snickers. Snickers. Candy corn. What else? Candy corn? That's a, that's a good one. Um, okay. Now, I tell you what was the <laughs> bomb. You know what my favorite scene is? What from- about Peeps? I know it's Easter. Easter, I know, but do you eat them? I eat them. You would? Yeah, I would. I would. Um, You know, what's really funny is that when I was a kid, and I don't know if they still give this out, but the thing that would be a total bummer for me is when I'd get the box of raisins. Oh! You guys remember the box of raisins? That was a dud, wasn't it? (laughs) I mean, if you get the Um, raisins, like, ugh. I can picture the house in the neighborhood we grew up in that gave away fruit. Oh, fruit. Oh, that's a Oh, it one. was like, oh, gross. And like an apple that's like bruised or an orange that looks like it's been like, you know, at the bottom of my bag, <laughs> at the bottom of my pillowcase. That's funny. That's I funny. didn't like getting fresh fruit for Halloween. No, definitely not. Definitely no not. No offense if anybody in here gives fresh fruit, but just saying from the kid, Maybe you still have time to make another plan. Kids don't want fresh fruit, right? Yeah, so, so we are, we are um, needing 100,000 uh, pieces of candy. So, you know, Jess is going to talk about this a little bit later in the live cast. But we, the thing I want to encourage you is we, we need a fresh supply because I'm always bringing up that number. We, we knock it down a bit, but then I kind of, my, my eating the candy that's, here. Well, that's, that's okay. You're going to add an extra bag this I'm week I'm going to add my store. own bag. We're going to gonna hold Rod this. accountable. He's got this cup of candy. Oh, it no, looks it's, like it's, tea, but it's, no, it's don't be full. It's actually the wrappers. It's actually <laughs> all of his wrappers. The wrappers that I'm eating. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the kind of pre-show uh, information. Okay, so good morning, Jonathan, and good morning, Stephen. Love it. Bree says Twix is her favorite. And Jonathan um, says Kit Kat. Oh, yes. That's another good yum, one. Yum, yum. Okay, so in our neighborhood... Okay. Do you have a plan for trick-or-treating COVID Halloween? No, I think we are kind of pulling it back this year. Your your cul-de-sac is? Yeah, it is, unfortunately. Yeah. Ours, we still have a lot of young kids on it. So we're still starting with a happy hour, but bring all your own stuff. So we're not going to have like any buffet lines or anything. Um, You know, I've shared this before. One of my favorite Halloween treats. We already bought it. It's a bowl of pumpkin poop. You know what this is? Oh, no. (laughs) Go ahead. It's cheese puffs. Kids love it. You just make a little tag, write pumpkin poop, and they just die over it. (laughs) So anyway, we already bought it. 
But we're just going <laughs> to stick our own hands in it. No neighborhood hands in the pumpkin poop this year. So that's just our lunch this week. Um, but we're going to still have happy hour on my driveway, 5 p.m., group picture. Kids spread out in their Halloween costumes. And then our street's doing tables on, the, on your driveway. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, we just want to also remind you, Ryan is challenging everyone to um, be sure to send in the selfies of, um, yeah. of where they're maybe watching the live cast. So he's Look again, at our walls. He's put out, what's that? The walls. Yes, the walls. We've captured, if you're in here in the live audience, we've, we're putting these maybe up our, as we speak. Yeah, maybe our, our so, production team could show online the Zoom walls. Yeah. Exactly. So Close. be sure to... Um, He's sure to text him. He's put his actual mobile number into the comment section. Yes, yes so thank you. Can you. Send that. Good. We so have online can see that when you send your picture in, I love these walls. So it's going to be a good time. Hey, we got some great things taking place this morning. We are continuing on it in the series that we've been in called Hope is Open. Got some great music that we'll be sharing. And we got some very important announcements as to what's taking place throughout the rest of October. Yeah. It's going to be, we're going to finish this month strong, so it's going to be a fantastic time. Anything else, Jess, you want to add? Um, no, I'm just looking here. I want to say good morning to Simon, and I really want to say good morning to Kara and Doug. And Doug, welcome home from Kuwait. Oh, wow. Doug and Kara are usually on watching church together while oh. Doug's in Kuwait, and he made it home this week. So if oh, you're in the room, you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. give Doug a big welcome and cheer. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. yes. That's he just got so back from... oh, that's wonderful, awesome. and we've been praying for that. Um, yes, so we're going to get started in about 20 seconds, and good job to those of you who made it out here in the snow. Aren't we thankful for the snow with the fires? Yes, and there First is a time. food truck coming later. It's a lobster shack, so Fantastic. we'll tell you about it at the end. Okay, so Jess, yeah. we're going to see um, everyone in just a little while after this, um, the service opens up. We're beginning with a great song to start off our morning. So thank you guys, everyone, and we'll see you a little bit later on, whether you're here in this room or Facebook on our online campus.
Well, welcome. We are so glad to see all of you here in person, and welcome to those of you online, too. My name is Jessica, and wherever you're watching or whenever you're watching this, we're glad to be here with you today. Yes, and my name is Rod, and I also want to welcome you and those of you here are part of our live audience, and then I encourage you right now to make the most of this experience, this live cast experience. Go to crossroadscolorado.com forward slash gather, and that's your one stop for all of our resources. You'll find out all about our various different gatherings that take place throughout the week. You're going to find a digital place where you can take message notes, and even the digital connect card where you can sign up for some of the many opportunities you're going to be hearing about throughout the live cast. And if you're here in this room, I want to encourage you, when you walked in, you received a few things, a giving envelope, a talk notes, but then I'd like all of us to encourage us to take a moment to fill out the connect card because we utilize as a way for contact tracing in an event we need to do so. So please make use of this, fill out the card, and you can drop these off in the orange Hope is Here boxes at the end of service. Yes, and next weekend is huge. We are launching new pod-based elementary kids groups. These are going to happen in a variety of ways. At-home groups here at the Taft Avenue location, pod groups, and also Zoom pod groups online, if that's safest for you right now, too. They will be filled through registration process at crossroadscolorado.com slash CK groups. So check check that out or check the box on this connect card and in order to make more room for the in-person worship gatherings and these kids pod groups we are going to be adding service times next week so take note of this we will still have our thursday at 6 30 p.m live cast and in-person gathering as well as now moving to sundays at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And the kids groups will be happening in those Sunday morning services. It's all starting up next week. So you'll hear more about this from Katie in a minute. That's great, Jess. And as for today, we are continuing on in this series called Hope is Hope. And in fact, we're right at the midway point. And for all of our series, we have an anchor verse that we encourage you to memorize and to live into. And the anchor verse for Hope is Open is Matthew 5, 9 that says, Blessed are the peacemakers, so they will be called children of God. And today we're going to continue to live into this learning of what it means to follow the Prince of Peace, Jesus, and create a discipleship pathway so all, everyone can come to the table. In fact, our music team is going to do a great song by that very title, Come to the Table, Enjoy. And we'll see you at the end of the at the fam at the live cast.
Good morning. It's great to see you. If you are joining us online, if you're here in the room, thanks for being here today. And uh, it is good to see some of you. It is good to get texts from some of you. Uh, Listen, if you're uh, in the room or if you're watching online, do me a favor and send me a selfie of where you are and uh, what you're doing right now, because uh, I'd love to see that. And make sure you send your name. Uh, And uh, I just love getting those pictures. So my my cell phone is 207-608-1106. That is actually my cell phone number. So if you'll send me a selfie of you and your family watching the live cast, or if you're here in the room, send me a selfie of you and put your name with it. Uh, And I would love to have that. And I'll be praying for you this week uh, by your name and picture. And it helps me get to know everyone in this crazy season uh, of time where we're gathered together. So thanks for doing that. Hey, listen, I've got a couple things I want to share with you um, in these next few moments before we jump into our talk today. And the first is uh, Oktoberfest is coming up in uh, just a week or so. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to just love our community and love the kids that are uh, not only just a part of our church, but also a part of our broader community here in the neighborhoods and in our partnership with the Edmondson School. And so we're going to be having uh, our parking lot's going to have like a a drive-through trunk or treat where uh, we're going to be dressed up with our trunks decorated and kids can uh, drive. Kids probably won't be driving the cars. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but uh, So they're going to drive through and get to see us all dressed up. And then at the end of the drive through they're going to get this big bag of candy. Uh, and then there's a photo booth where they can jump out of their car and get their picture taken with their uh, costumes on. And there's going to be some food trucks for families that would like to eat socially distance and engage in some of the food trucks here. And that's next Saturday. And there's a couple things that are happening. So one, we're bringing in candy. We are bringing in candy, all of us together. And so I want to encourage you this week, while you're out, grab a big old bag of candy, maybe a thousand pieces or so, five of those big 250 bags of candy, and drop it off here at the Taft Avenue location, because we have volunteers that are going to be putting together those bags of candy uh, for uh, for those kiddos. And so you can do that. You can also drop ship it from Amazon, or you can just write a gift in on your uh, giving envelope to uh, give a little bit extra for the candy, if that's easier for you, whatever it might be. But we want to collect candy. We also are doing trunks. I'm the Grinch. I mean, not the actual Grinch, but I'm, we're doing the, the Grinch who stole Christmas, our trunk. So uh, I'm going to be the Grinch. Uh, Wendy, my wife, she's going to be uh, Cindy Lou Who. Micah's going to be Max, I think. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun and decorate our trunk. I, I love doing this. It's just so much fun for families. So, uh, so if you could, join me. Be a trunk. We'd love to have 50 trunks out there. And I think we've got me. Not a fun parade, okay? As much as I love to decorate my trunk, one trunk isn't going to cut it, folks, all right? So uh, sign up uh, to be a part of the, trunk, the trunks, and you can do that right on your Connect card, either digitally, or you can do it with the paper Connect cards you have in person. And then the, here's another really cool thing about Oktoberfest is Oktoberfest launches our Stuff the Truck initiative. So all of November is Stuff the Truck, where we are, I, I talk to the folks in charge, uh, the team, the volunteers, and my understanding is we're trying to raise four million pounds of food, which is two tons, two tons, according to my math. I don't know, something like that. But no, uh, we're, we're raising food. And so we want to help feed hungry people. And uh, all throughout the month of November, every time you come into Taft Avenue, if we're gathering, which we hope to be, but we'll see what happens, who knows. Uh, but either way, we can drop food off and we want to stuff the truck. There's going to be a truck that we're going to fill up with food to donate to local uh, food pantries and places that are feeding the hungry. And so that's exciting. And so on Oktoberfest, you can bring in items and people that come to participate, we're encouraging them to bring items as we begin our stuff the truck emphasis in November. So that's going to be an absolutely great time. It's from 2 to 3.30. You can sign up for all those things. If you can't be there on Saturday or you're not comfortable being there on Saturday, I understand stand with COVID and different people and their comfortable uh, levels, uh, comfort levels, excuse me. Uh, there's always ways to volunteer in safe, uh, safe ways. And one of the ways is we can all be praying. We can all be praying this week that this event would just bring some hope into our community and offer kids a fun experience. It's probably what's going to be a very crazy uh, Halloween season, uh, right? So uh, that's awesome. So that's Oktoberfest, right? Now, uh, we want to take a a moment today and pray for our firefighters. We want to take a moment to just offer thanksgiving for snow, right? If you're in home, like 
look out your window and say, not only did the snow give you an even better excuse not to have to drive over to this building today, uh, it also is helping the fires and uh, the firefighters. And so we wanna take a moment together and just continue to pray. Will you join me, whether you're at home or you're in the room, just join me in prayer, Lord. Thank you for this snow. We have been praying, God, that the weather would turn and we are so grateful and we're so thankful for it, Lord. And we are thankful for the firefighters. We are thankful for those uh, who are in fire management. We are thankful that they can engage with the fire uh, today. We are so thankful, Lord, for their bravery and we thank for, for their sacrifice. We're thankful for their families, Lord, that haven't seen them in days and days and some even weeks. We're thankful for the fire departments from all over that have come to Colorado to serve and to help us. We are grateful for that, Lord. We're grateful that our church can be a place that they know uh, is available and, 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 and ready to stage and house firefighters as needed. I thank you for this community and our heartbeat to be a part of it, Lord. And so will you just continue to give wisdom and strength and protection? And we pray for those families uh, all over that have been affected by this fire, who've lost homes, possessions, Lord, we pray for those families who've lost family members, that your peace would come, that your church would figure out ways to come and support and love in the midst of it. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, We're a church that believes in prayer. I don't know if you know that or not. You're sitting here. Maybe you don't. Well, hopefully you will eventually. But uh, believe that prayer works somehow. It's a mystery. But we also believe prayer isn't enough. Right? We also believe we want to be people of action. So we're going to do something really simple today. Uh, the lights are going to come up a little bit, and you'll notice around you are these little cards, right? Uh, we're going to just write thank you notes to the firefighters this morning. All right, and, and I'd love for you to write as many as you can. In just a second, we're gonna give you a five minute countdown and we're gonna write notes. We know for a fact, we've talked with the leadership that these notes means so much to our firefighters. Sometimes they take these notes, they put them in the lunches that they deliver, and while they're out working so hard to get a note means so much. And so we are a church of action. Uh, We are not just sitting around saying, go do this at home. We believe in this enough to take some of our precious moments together uh, and do this, all right? So we're gonna give you a five-minute countdown, write as many thank you notes as you can to firefighters and their families, and then at the end of the service, uh, as you're leaving today, you'll just drop it in the orange orange giving kiosk with your connect card and your giving envelope. If you're at home watching this, grab a piece of paper right now. Maybe you've got some note cards sitting around, but just grab a blank sheet of paper. Maybe you've got a home printer. Just grab one of those pieces of paper and write a thank you note. It doesn't have to be fancy. Write that thank you note and you can do one of two things with it. You can mail it here to the Taft Avenue facility and we'll make sure that it goes out with all of our other thank you notes. Or you can swing by the building and drop it off during the day in one of the orange kiosks that'll be out in the atrium, all right? So if you're at home, we want you to do this. If you're here in the room, we want you to do it as well, all right? Uh, If you need a pen, uh, get one. (laughs) <laughs> There's pens around. There's pens back in the table. I think we have some ushers that might be able to float around with some clean pens for you as well. Uh, but uh, So we're going to give you a five-minute countdown. We're going to give you some writing music, a little more upbeat writing music. We don't want you to write long love letters here, you know. So we're going to give you a little change of pace music, uh, give you a five-minute countdown, and then uh, we'll continue on with some great information from Katie, and then we'll uh, continue with our series, Hope is Open. Showers in the month of May. The ground's still wet and the sky's still gray. But you're still shining. No cadences or chords to play. No melodies or words to say. But you're still singing And it keeps me breathing When I fall apart To a million pieces When I don't know where to start
hands that shake Darling, I'll be steady When you're at the end of your tired rope When you're feeling trapped and just need to go Darling, I'll be ready when you fall apart into a million pieces when you don't know where to start. I'll put you back together. Back together again. I'll put you back. We're talking big stuff for Crossroads Kids. New and expanded service times in November, and this weekend, we're thinking about the unique power of your voice. I'm Katie Martinez, and here's what you need to know. CK groups are starting Sunday, November 1st. CK stands for Crossroads Kids, and these groups are the new pod-based elementary kids program. It's video-driven with lessons, music, and hands-on activities. On-campus groups meet during Sunday services at 9 and 11 and are led by trained staff and volunteers. Some groups meet at home, where parents push play and are supported by cheerful volunteers who deliver supplies to your doorstep weekly. Either way, registration for CK groups is essential. So get those kiddos signed up now at crossroadscolorado.com slash CK groups. Well, we are committed to gathering responsibly during this strange and hopefully short-lived pandemic. Technically, it's gone on too long to be short-lived, but we sure don't want to do anything to delay the health and healing of the world that God loves and God made. So we're adding service times in November to make enough space on campus to gather responsibly. We're making more space for those kids groups and in-person worship services in the auditorium. So in addition to setting your clocks forward an hour on November 1st, 
Please note that we are moving to two Sunday services, 9 and 11 a.m. And always remember you can join us Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. as well. So three services beginning November 1, in person and a live broadcast. Finally, this weekend, we're thinking about the unique power of your voice. And here are some familiar voices to cheer you on as you do the most important and responsible thing you've done in a long time. Hi, I'm Katie Martinez. I'm John Smith. I'm Isaac Bartholomew. And I am grateful to have a role in this world where I get to use my voice. Come November 3rd, every American gets to use their voice to vote. To vote. To vote. It requires no words, but will be heard forever. No matter who you are or how you do it, please, please, please let your voice be heard. All right. Good morning. I'm back. Nice to see everybody. <laughs> the six of you are like, oh, great. This is when it starts. <laughs> it's so good to see you. Hey, thanks for wearing your masks, everybody. Uh, it, it's good to know we have a community of faith that's willing to just uh, be a little bit uncomfortable for the sake of others, and that is wonderful. And uh, I, I'm proud of us for being that kind of a space. So uh, good to have everybody here today. Thank you for joining online. My name is Ryan, and I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads Church. And uh, we are in a series called Hope is Open, where we've been exploring the connection between hope and peacemaking and really looking at where we believe God is calling us as a community for this next season of our kind of gathered church lives. So what it means to follow Jesus. So if you're a guest today, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being here in the room. Uh, if you've missed the last few weeks, you can always tune in if you want to. This is a unique series for us and that it really does build week after week. And I don't think you'll be lost today any more than anybody else will be lost just because the nature of me speaking. But uh, you, might, you might say, oh, that's interesting. You might want to go back and watch a couple or listen to, through the podcast, a couple of the talks. And this will give you a good idea, especially if you're a guest, of what our uh, faith community is all about. I believe that Crossroads has always been and will continue to be a unique expression of the body of Christ in northern Colorado to bring hope and life and love into this community and into our lives to strengthen families uh, and really just be a space of unconditional love, which is what God is. So uh, our very first week, uh, about four weeks ago, we launched with this big idea that hope is hidden when peace is broken. And we talked about peace being shalom, this idea of fullness and wholeness. And that's where we kind of got our anchor verse that Rod mentioned earlier that says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. That the evidence, the fruit of our lives of actually being in the family business, being a part of what God is doing in this world is peacemaking. And so we're spending uh, really this whole series unpacking this big idea. And we started with this question of how is peace uh, broken in our world? And in the second week, we said that selfishness and arrogance break peace and hide hope. Uh, that as we looked and explored some passages in scripture, we saw that really the, the fundamental issue and where wholeness is broken is in our selfishness and in our arrogance right? And, uh, and then last week, we jumped into some pretty big topics. If you've been around church for a while, if you haven't been around church for a while, you're probably like, why are we talking about this? Um, but we talked about this idea of the death and resurrection of Jesus. We talked about this theological idea of atonement and incarnation and what those are all about and how we want to talk about them in this season of ministry in the life of the big C church. And we basically said that Jesus's death and resurrection ultimately opens this universal path to peace, universal path to wholeness. That's the beauty of Jesus's life, death, resurrection, and really the gift of the spirit of God to all of creation. And that what we want to do is trust that mystery that we trust the mystery that it works. And it's fun to explore the how and the why, but it is a mystery, the way in which this opens our souls to God. And this week we wanna ask the question, what does it mean to be a disciple of the Prince of Peace? So we start with this kind of crazy big question of disciple and discipleship, which are not typical words that you hear floating about in your everyday normal life. So we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. You know, last January, which seems so long ago, how many of y'all remember January, 2020? right? January 2020. Uh, I remember just scrolling through my Facebook feed and uh, Wendy and I and our family, we had been here in Northern Colorado for about three months. We were feeling like we were starting to make our way around. I was having to use my GPS less and less to get around, which I still have to 
<laughs> like we were, we've been inside for so long for the last nine months. I'm still like, how do I get to Target? You know, I'm putting it in my GPS. But uh, I wanted to go on an adventure because I saw uh, somebody in our church who I had met through the young adult group. I had gone and visited and met some of our young adults. And, uh, and he, he went out and did like this winter adventure. They went and did some hiking. And I thought, I want to do, I want to go on a winter adventure. That'll be fun. And so I sent a Facebook message to this gentleman. Uh, we'll call him Ryan because uh, that's his name. And, uh, and, and, and I said, Ryan, I, next time you go on an adventure, let me know. I want to go. And he was like, all right, man, that'd be great. And about a week later in uh, early January, mid he says, well, how does this weekend look? How about Saturday? I said, oh, Saturday looks great. He says, he says, well, what do you think about doing your first 14er? I had been here for not very long, right? And I was like, sure. I didn't really know what that meant. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm in, 14er, okay. And I knew it meant like a 14,000 foot peak and I knew it meant a hike of some sort. And uh, he says, okay, well, we're gonna go do this one mountain and it was one of the easier, he says, it's one of the easiest 14ers. We'll go do it, it'll be fun uh, and it's gonna be great. And this was me <laughs> dying, <laughs> like literally dying. Uh, we started, at, he said, I'll pick you up at three in the morning. Three in the morning? What in the world? So picks me up at three in the morning. We had to drive two hours to the, uh, we couldn't even drive to the, uh, the trailhead of Bierstadt. I didn't know the name of the mountain at the time that I was climbing, right? Or walking or hiking, whatever. And, uh, and, he, and as we're going, he's like, we won't be able to go to the trailhead. We'll have about a mile and a half hike up to the trailhead. Is that okay? I was like, yeah, sure, fine. That's fine. No big deal. Whatever. It's fine. <laughs> so I was tired before we got to the trailhead, right? So we do this hike, and, and, and I felt so bad for Ryan. Like, he was so gracious. Like, this hike should have taken, even in the wintry conditions, like maybe two and a half hours there and an hour and a half back. It was like eight hours. We were going, like me. I mean, I'm just like, oh, gosh, I'm going to die, you know? And, uh, and so it's freezing. But it, and this was me. Like, and so I just had to stop. Like, every 10 feet, I'm stopping. But Ryan was so great. Like, he was there encouraging me. He was like, we can do this. Don't worry. Are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And the one thing I'm not is a quitter. Like, we're going to make it, you know? And I think he thought he was going to have to carry me down. Like, I really, this poor guy, he's like, what's going on? But here, here, I made it to the summit. Here I am at the summit, right? And uh, we do the nice picture together, and we have the big selfie. And then we come back down, because it was so dark when we started. Uh, we got back to the trailhead and I said, well, I got to take a picture because that's how far we walked. Like I was like blown away. I was like, I would, if I would have seen that in the daytime, I probably wouldn't have done it. Right. But one thing that Ryan said is we finished this like awful day. Right. He says, next we need to do Long's Peak. That's what he said to me. And, and me, I'm just like, I always like to try difficult things. That's kind of one of the things about me that I just, I enjoy stuff that is difficult and challenging. I said, okay, great. I said, all right, I'm in. He says, whatever you do, don't watch any videos. That's what he said. He said, don't watch any videos. I'll get you through it. I've done it lots of times. Just follow me. I will get you through it. He says, we're going to do longs. And so that kind of got in my head. I stuck in my head. Okay, we're going to do longs peak. That'll be fun. So as the weather turned, I reached out to him. I said, Ryan, I'm going to get a group of people together and we're going to do longs peak. He said, okay, just don't watch any videos. And what do you think I did? I watched every video and I was scared to death. And I recruited four or five people and we took our camper and we can't, because this one you have to do it like one in the morning, right? How many of you have done long speak? A lot of folks have, right? Uh, and, and so one, one in the back there, that's awesome. The rest of you all I am better than. Uh, and so, no, I'm just kidding, it's a joke. It's just a joke. I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm better than you, but it's not because of that. Uh, and so, <laughs> That's a joke too. It's just a joke. Um, and so, so we got, we, we went and do the long speak thing and I watched every, but I was scared out of my head. I was sleepless some nights, like just freaking out. Like I am going to die. Why am I doing this? Right. Just watching what other people had done and other people giving their tips and how to make it to the top and this and that. And I thought this is going to be, but Ryan just kept saying, I'll get you through it. I'll get you through it. And here I am at the summit of Long's Peak. Can you imagine? And I was actually smiling at this one. I was actually smiling at this one, right? And you got to remember, like something you don't know about is I don't like heights. <laughs> I don't like heights at all. Like it's not my jam, not at all. Uh, roller coasters, things like that. I'm, and it's not the height that bothers me. It's the falling and dying that does. Um, and so I have a healthy respect for that, right? But we made it up there and Ryan was just this amazing guide. And here's the, uh, some of us that went, uh, one of us that, that made it to the summit wasn't in the picture. I'm not sure where they were, but um, so Ryan, our guide, got us 
was doing. This guy was insane. Up and down, back and forth, checking in on everybody, just getting everybody through, being an encouragement. You know, it was, he, he was an amazing guide. And what I learned about like hiking and, and this uh, whole experience of doing these 14ers was that when I needed a trail, I needed somebody to have gone ahead and created a trail. Like I was never going to go do Long's Peak as a first person. <laughs> I'm not a trailblazer. You know what I mean? But I needed somebody to blaze the trail. And then I also learned something about me that I needed to understand the trail. Like he said, don't watch any videos, but that's not my mind. My mind is like, I want to know exactly what I'm getting into. And I don't think, honestly, I would have been able to do it had I not watched the videos, had I not known what the keyhole was, had I not known what was beyond the keyhole in the, the, uh, the, the, the ledges, had I not known that after the ledges was the trough, had I not known that after the trough was the narrows, and had I not known after the narrows was the home stretch, I just wouldn't have been mentally ready for it. I would have seen it, peed myself, and ran back. Like, that's what would have happened in that moment, you know? But I needed to be able to understand the trail, right? Kind of like I needed a trail map. I needed to see it. I needed to know others' experiences so that I could then make it my own. And I also learned that I needed a guide. I can honestly say I don't know that I could have done either one of those hikes without Ryan, somebody who had been there before. Now, Ryan wasn't the trailblazer. He didn't go make the trail ahead of time and say, I plotted it out, right? But he had been there, he had gone ahead, he know, knew what he was doing, and he got me through it. Right? I needed that. And as I think about this idea of following Jesus, as I think about this big mountain of trying to understand God, this task that we're given as human beings, like not just Christians in the West, but people since the beginning of time, we've wondered, what does it mean? What is God? How do we understand it? Like this mountain of God, this mountain of faith, this mountain of peacemaking, I thought, boy, that's a very similar, right? That I need a trail. Like I need someone who's trailblazed that path and has shown me the way to understanding God appropriately. And I need a map. Like I need a guide. I need something that can keep me focused. You know, uh, on, uh, I keep thinking that my, I keep, hold on a second. I have sensory issues. It was like really bugging me. Sorry about that. My apologies. Right? So I, I feel I needed that, like, that, that trail, right? But I also needed that map and that guide. I needed to have some handle. You know, at Long's Peak, there's like a hundred different ways you can summit this mountain. I didn't realize that. There's one way I would ever do it, right? But there's like a hundred different ways. But I just needed this. I needed a very simple, clear way. Like, this is what you're going to do. This hike starts here. And it broke it down into segments for me. And, I, and, and ultimately, in my faith, I feel like I want that too. I, I want that. And I want a guide. I want somebody kind of helping me along the way. Now, here's the challenge. Christianity, this religion that developed out of the person of Jesus, which I like to say this, by the way, I don't believe Jesus ever intended to start a religion. I just think it's what we're good at as human beings. <laughs> I think as humans, we're just really good at trying to create structures and systems that force people into a, a group, right? We're just very good at, at at just kind of delineating ourselves from others. We love our groups. But I don't think that was ever Jesus's intent. Uh, but but I, I think that Christianity, this religion, it's offered to us all these different paths of discipleship. This word discipleship, the way in which we become like Jesus in, in, the, in the Christian world. I would say the way in which we become like love would be the more universal way of understanding Jesus and understanding discipleship, Right? But in the midst of all of the Christian ways that we offer these paths, Jesus really, I believe, only offers one. So we have done this and we've said, well, here's the path. If you're part of this church or this denomination, you go through these hoops, you follow this path, and then you become like Jesus. And that might look like classes that you go through. That might look like things you have to memorize. That might look like a, a type of baptism or certain things you have to do with your kids. But we have hundreds of these different paths, thousands of them that are all out there. But I really think Jesus offers us one. And so I'd like to take a few minutes and look at one verse, one sentence in the Bible today to explore what Jesus says about following him in discipleship. And, and, and I hope as we kind of walk through this one simple statement, 
we can be challenged with what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? And we can begin to understand, for those of you that have been a part of Crossroads, and you're still trying to figure out who I am as this new pastor, what does that mean for our church, that you'll get an idea of the language and what we're seeing God and what we believe. I think as a church, God is inviting us to share with people and what God is inviting us to become in this day and age, in this expression of faith. So we want to look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 today. I'm going to try and talk as fast as I can, okay? Because I have far too many words for the amount of time we have. Far too many words, all right? So Matthew 16, 24 starts like this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, this is the first word. It's an important word. It's a Bible word. We should unpack it for just a second. The word disciple in Jesus's day meant a person who would go seek out a teacher, often called a rabbi, and ask that rabbi, can I become your disciple? And the rabbi would look at them and would figure out, are they smart enough? Are they committed enough? Are they dedicated enough? And then the rabbi would say yes, or would say, I don't think so. (laughs) I don't think you're quite the one, right? Because to be a disciple of a rabbi in Jesus' day in this context meant giving up everything. It meant total submission to the rabbi's teaching. It meant imitation of the rabbi. However the rabbi ate, you ate. If they slept on their left side, you slept on your left side. I mean, it was total full imitation, right? Now, this is what makes Jesus quite unique, right? In that Jesus' disciples were invited. They were probably too old to become disciples, quite honestly. Disciples would start much earlier. They had probably been rejected. They probably couldn't find a teacher that would take them. And so Jesus goes into the margins and chooses the most unlikely candidates, He would choose the sinners of the day, the ones labeled as outsiders, the ones who were having to work manual labor, that just, they just weren't smart enough. But Jesus saw something and invited them in, right? And Jesus tells us something unique about discipleship and being a disciple. He said this later on in Matthew. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father in heaven. What Jesus is saying here is that there's a difference in in becoming a Christian, right? We use that word becoming a Christian. Jesus wouldn't say that, but the principle is there's a difference between becoming a Christian and being Christian, right? There's this difference. So Jesus said it in terms of like, just because you say, Lord, Lord, that doesn't mean really anything. You're not going to be in the kingdom of heaven. And remember for Jesus, the kingdom of heaven wasn't something that happened when you died, (laughs) It was something that happened in this life that was being inaugurated and we were being exposed to and being brought into. And Jesus says, just because you cry out, Lord, Lord, just because you have this understanding, it's when you do the will of my Father. It's when you live in this pattern of life. In our like modern expression, for those of us that are here, the heritage that we come out of within Christianity, I think Jesus would say to us, just because you pray some prayer, that doesn't make you a disciple of mine. You've got to do the will of my Father. And that's why there's always this tension within scriptural texts about doing and believing, doing and speaking and doing and saying, right? And so Jesus, I think, would say, there is such thing as a disciple, and it is a person that does submit wholly, 100% of their life to this Jesus way, not to a denomination, not to a religion, but to a path, a way, a way of understanding the world, a way of understanding our own lives in relationship to this world that God is redeeming and restoring. And so Jesus then goes on and he starts breaking down some things in Matthew 16, 24. The next part of this one verse says, Jesus says to his disciples, the ones that had committed themselves to imitating him, the ones that had fully surrendered and submitted to his way, whatever it was going to be, he says this, all those who wish to come after me must Two things, deny themselves and take up their cross. I would like to say that Jesus does not ever say, you must pray this specific prayer, you must join this specific sect, you must, he doesn't do any of that. I mean, he doesn't say you must believe this about God, you must have all your theology right, you must know who's in and who's out. All that is the knowledge of good and evil, which from day one we were told, don't even worry about that. So Jesus comes and says, if you want to come after me, if you really want to be my disciple, you have to, first of all, deny yourself. Second of all, take up your cross. A couple things about these big words. Deny yourself. This word here means to disown. That's pretty strong language. So what does that mean? Do you have to hate yourself? No, I think what Jesus is saying here is we have to disown ourselves as being our ruler, our center. There has to be a movement away. 
it's not just denying ourselves of our appetites that are impure, right? Which is what I think moral, moralism wants us to do, right? Like religious moralism wants us to read this as the denial of certain things. Don't drink alcohol, don't play cards, don't smoke, don't chew, don't hang out with those who do, right? That's the, that's the way we tend to want to believe what Jesus is saying, but, but it's so much deeper. It's saying, no, the center of my existence, the one that I submit to, the one that I bow my knee to is not myself, It's not the culture that I live in that wants to give me my values. I have to deny all of that and I have to take up my cross. In other words, Jesus is saying there is a death involved here. You know, interestingly enough, this statement of Jesus, most Jesus scholars, people that spend their whole lives really examining the words of Jesus, the historicity of some of these statements, most of them would say, Jesus probably never said this phrase exactly as we have it here. And that shouldn't freak anybody out, right? It shouldn't freak anybody out because Truly, if Jesus would have said this to people as he's walking around, they would never have understood the statement, take up your cross, right? They'd be like, what is he talking about? I mean, the cross was this brutal instrument of torture. They would have never got, it'd be like us standing up and saying, well, if you really want to be a part of this church, you need to take up your electric chair and take up your lethal injection and follow me. Like that would make no sense. But post the cross, post the resurrection, you can take a whole bunch of Jesus's teachings and go, I get it. And so now we have this wonderful statement and we can see that there is an injustice to it, right? When Jesus says, take up your cross, what was the cross for Jesus? We talked about this last week. The cross was this moment of no more violence. <laughs> like it was a moment of, of total forgiveness. To take up our cross, again, is not, sim- now morality is important, but it's not simply the, 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 the withholding of morals or, or the withholding of pleasure, right? To take up our cross is actually to say, the pain that you throw at me, I will hold and I will not return it as pain. I will hold it in my person and I will die on that cross for your sin, the way you just treated me, and I'll return it to you as love. That's totally different than, well, we're not going to watch R-rated movies. <laughs> See why it's a lot easier to just not watch R-rated movies? It, 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 and again, I'm not here to tell you not to watch R-rated movies. It's just a sample of what I grew up with, right? It's not that there's PG movies you shouldn't watch, right? I mean, the, the idea here is what the cross actually stands for is when my spouse is having a bad day and they yell at me or they lash out at me, To take up my cross in that moment is to absorb that pain, to absorb that hurt, to absorb that sin against me and return it as love. And that's a totally different thing. And see what Jesus is doing here, he's talking about a completely new way to think about God. There's a a new understanding of God here. There's a new revelation of God, which is why we see in a section of Jesus' teachings, it'd say, well, you've heard it said, but I tell you. Like God's always revealing new things. And in Jesus, we're getting a brand new, reconstructed, redeeming understanding of God. And Jesus would talk about it in terms of new wine and old wineskins in Matthew chapter 9. He would say things like, you know, nobody puts new wine into old wineskins for the old wineskins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. He says, no, new wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. What Jesus is saying is you can't take this new understanding of God and cram it into an old wineskin, an old model, an old vessel of God. There has to be continual new life, right? So this new wine is that, that God's always revealing new things about God's self that for every generation, there needs to be a fresh understanding, right? So let me ask you this question, especially for those of you that are watching or you're in the room and you've been following Jesus. You would have called yourself a Christian for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Let me ask you this question. When was the last time you learned something new about God? You know, I'm ashamed to say that in my life, there was probably 10 years of being in full-time, you know, leadership of a church, vocational ministry, that I didn't learn anything new about God because I probably thought I had it all figured out. I mean, after all, I had done seven years of school. I mean, I'd grown up in the church. I'd, I had a Bible in my hand since probably before I had teeth. And after all, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What new is there to learn? How... We mistake the constancy of God's character of love and mercy and grace as if we understand fully this one who is creating the universe. Like right now, the universe is continually being created. It's ever expanding. 
the, the arrogance that would go into my life in those 10 years, it's mind-numbing to think I could actually know everything there is to know about the God of the universe. And so God says, no, 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 hold on. I'm doing a new thing. There's always this new understanding that's needed as human conscious develops, as we evolve as people, as we understand one another, as the world gets smaller, as we start to see the other closer to who we are. And so there's a new wineskin that's needed Like we as people need to recognize we need to be created new. And I believe that grace, this work of God, maybe the spirit of God is a way to think, but the grace itself is always looking for new wineskins in every generation to hold new and fresh understandings of God. So as a person who who has been, lived my whole life in faith, I always think God is always looking for me to become a new wineskin And as soon as I refuse to become a new wineskin, as soon as I refuse to live into this continual renewal, this death and resurrection process over and over and over again in my life, I can no longer be a vessel that can hold the new things of God, the new revelation of God. and, and, And again, any revelation is inconsistent with that God is love and mercy that God is is care for the poor. Like there's new ways in which God is revealing this to us in our world. And, And this idea of being a disciple of Jesus is nothing short of becoming a new creation. It's nothing short of living this brand new life that is different in its essence. Right? It's different in, in the way in which we view and see and understand the other, the way in which we understand ourselves. Paul would say it this way in his letter to the Romans. He said, we were therefore buried with him through baptism. This is a symbolism of our death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, this new life, we too would live a new life. So that's why baptism, if you're here today and you're like brand new to faith and and maybe you've heard talk of baptism and what's that all about, like the beauty of baptism is the symbol that it holds, that there is this new life, this new creation that we walk into, that we are transformed. And it's a transformed of our total essence and understanding of who we are in relationship to God and others. And I would say this, where where Paul says, uh, it's, it's no small thing that Paul says that we might live a new life. Because I have to say that new life is meant to be lived. <laughs> I know that sounds so like dumb to say out loud. Like, well, of course, but we don't. We think a new life is meant to be learned. We think a new life is meant to be worshiped. A new life is meant to be celebrated. It's meant to be lived in our world. We actually have to live this out. And this is what Jesus means in Matthew 16, 24, as he finishes up this statement on what it means to be his disciple, right? It says, Jesus said to his disciples, all those who wish to come after me must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. It's it's active. It's following Jesus. People get nervous when I say this, especially church people. How many would you would be super proud? You're like, I'm a church person. I've been around church for a long time. Just raise your hand and I sign. If you're at home, just own it. There's nothing wrong with it. But what I'm gonna say is gonna freak you out and I don't mean for it to freak you out, Okay but it's gonna freak you out, all right? But just hold it. Jesus says, take up their cross and follow me. He doesn't say follow the law. He doesn't say follow the Bible that I'm gonna give you in about 300 years. (laughs) Does that mean there's not wonderful things that we follow in the Bible? Yeah, but the truth is we don't follow the Bible. We follow Jesus and we interpret the Bible through the lens of Jesus and we recognize that, that what scripture actually is and what it is not. But Jesus says, follow me. And, and the scriptures, especially the gospels, are this beautiful picture that we get of Jesus. It's what God has given us in God's providence. And so for Jesus, when he would say, follow me, it would mean to hear and do. Right? You can't just be a hearer of things. You actually have to do. You can't just understand the law, even the law of Christ. You actually have to do it. And there is a difference between follow and worship. Do you know there is a danger to worshiping Jesus? Again, like my church people are freaking out right now. (laughs) No, listen, there's there's a danger to all good things, by the way. And if you've had too much chocolate cake, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like if you've had too many of, you, you bought like one of those like king size Reese's peanut butter cup packs with four of them and you thought I'll share them, but you didn't make it home to share right? There's a danger in worshiping Jesus. You know, the best way to kind of defang the gospel, the best way to, to really like 
take away the power of the message of Jesus is to just be satisfied worshiping the messenger. And I think that's what we've done. Because the truth is we can worship ourselves right out of obedience. Like we, we can do it. Like we can tune in and hear the worship music or come and listen to the message and we can get the little goosebumps on our arms and we can experience God's presence in a unique way. And then we can walk out going, oh, it just was so good. God's so pleased with me. God is so pleased with me. And it's very deceptive. And we, did we technically do anything wrong? Well, no. But did we do anything beautiful? Did we do anything that could actually save someone from, from this world and, and the lies of this world? Well, probably not. And the good, here's the good news is we shouldn't feel super bad about it because it's been happening since the beginning of time, right? This idea of worshiping ourselves out of obedience, the prophet Micah would say it this way in Micah 6, 7, and 8. Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? In other words, should I just worship perfectly because worship in ancient Israel was sacrifice. It was all about sacrifice, bringing in your, the sacrifices, the oil, pouring it over on the altar, bringing in the rams, at one point in time, there was human sacrifice all throughout human history. If we just do these laws, if we just worship right, isn't that what God wants? And we get this beautifully, wonderfully inspired passage that, that God speaks to the prophet Micah and says, he has shown you, pardon the he, you could use whatever pronoun you want there. God is neither male nor female, but that's the language that we had and have. And it says, God has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Nothing in there about singing, nothing in there about sacrifice, nothing in there about tithes, nothing in there about volunteering at the church. And the, all those are expressions of this sometimes. But the requirement, what is it to follow after this God? It's always been do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. Jesus is the perfect picture of this, by the way. If you want to know what it looks like to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly in your everyday normal life, it's Jesus. Paul would talk about it in terms of being a living sacrifice. We offer our bodies as living sacrifices, right? On the altar of justice and mercy and humility. So what is justice? Justice is getting what you deserve when you're oppressed. That's what justice is. The call to justice and righteousness is to be treated with human dignity, to be treated with the grace and the love of God, to stand up for those that have been oppressed, to give ourselves to the elevation of those who unjust systems have, have put into a space of poverty, have put into a space of, of criminality. That's justice. What's mercy? Mercy is getting what you don't deserve because you're loved. We act mercifully towards those. We meet needs of people that we might not understand. And we might even fall into some crazy idea of thinking, well, they don't deserve, but that's mercy. That's who God is for us. It's for, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What does it mean to walk humbly? It means to say, okay, I'm not the one leading the path. <laughs> to walk humbly is to say, I don't know everything. I hold my doctrines and my beliefs and my understandings of God in a, in a very loose way because I'm always growing. Because the wisdom from above is, first of all, humble. To walk humbly with God, to say, God's the one who's leading, I'm following. So I think Jesus taught this new wine, this new way of understanding God. And it wasn't new, <laughs> it was just a new understanding, it, it just trying to break through. But he specifically taught this idea of justice, mercy, and humility. And he taught it in such a clear way in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the core of Jesus' teaching. Jesus probably went from place to place teaching these principles over and over and over again. Jesus didn't write a new sermon every week of the year. <laughs> That'd be awesome as if we got the one last week. You know what I mean? It's like Jesus knows us. He's like, I'm gonna give you about eight things and let's just focus on those. But we get bored with the eight things. We think, well, we think I know it, so let's move on. But I really don't know it in my bones. I'm not out there. So the, the, I, I think that the, the, the Sermon on the Mount, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, this core of Jesus' teaching is the impractical path, right? Remember talking about needing that trail, Jesus blazed the trail and then he left us a trail guide. It's the Sermon on the Mount. In, in his book, A More Christ-like Way, Bradley Jerzak says it this way, God's heart is reflected perfectly by Jesus Christ, described perfectly in the Beatitudes, which is kind of the prelude to the Sermon on the Mount, 
and prescribed, in other words, given to us as something to obey perfectly in the Sermon on the Mount. And so here's the point. I know you're like, thank God the point. We can wrap this sucker up. The kickoff is happening soon. All right, here's the point. Disciples, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Disciples learn to do. We don't learn about, (laughs) but we learn to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly by following the path of Jesus that's found in the Sermon on the Mount. This is what it means to create a pathway of discipleship, to become like Jesus, to understand Jesus' teaching, and then to do it, to live it out. So what about your everyday normal life? What about tomorrow at 10 a.m.? So here's what this means for us as a church, for us as individuals, is that real spiritual growth has to be based and understood in love and action. Love in action. We cannot base and think about spiritual growth in terms of attendance, how many times I went to church, how many classes I took, do I know all the books of the Bible in order, right? It ha- we have to think about our maturity and am I able to produce love in action? Am I actually able to forgive that person who doesn't deserve it? Am I actually able to give of my hard-earned money that I worked hard for, that I'm not lazy for, that I feel like I were, can I actually give that to someone who doesn't deserve it? Can I hold that loosely? Like love in action. And and we're not talking about, it has to be, you don't have to go start a nonprofit, right? It's the simple everyday life stuff. But at some point in time, at some point in time, I had to stop watching YouTube videos about Long's Peak and I had to go to the trailhead and start walking the mountain, right? How how foolish would I sound if I were like, hey, I, I climbed Long's Peak via YouTube, just watched YouTube over and over again. It was as if I was there. And then I green screened myself on the back of it. It was awesome. I know exactly how to do it. But if I never go through that process of walking, getting tired, slipping, needing to take a break, getting off the trail, getting lost a little bit, jumping back on, I'm not actually in it. At some point, the mountain has to be experienced and and not just known. I can't just know about it. I have to experience it. So I want to encourage us to understand that what God is calling us to do as individuals and as a gathered church is to commit to living the blessed life of an everyday, normal peacemaker. What I believe God is calling us to is nothing new, but a new way of doing everything. What I believe God is calling the church, not just Christ, but the church, is to do everything in a new way. Nothing new, but just to do everything in a new way. That our lives would be modeled after this, in our everyday, as we go out and work and as we make money and as we buy things and as we invite people into our homes, as we go to church, all these things, it's not a new program. It's a new way of doing everything, this lens of the Sermon on the Mount. And so next week, we're actually gonna talk in detail. What are these works? We're gonna give a big overview of the Sermon on the Mount to say these are the works of an everyday normal peacemaker. These are the works that lead to this blessed life. And here's what I truly believe. I truly believe if we will submit that Jesus has blazed a trail of what it means to be human in this life, (laughs) truly human, to truly aspire and live in, in God, and Jesus has offered us a trail map, the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus has offered us history of people who've lived this out, that we will reach the summit of existence this side of eternity. And that summit is the blessed life of an everyday peacemaker, to live in the divine life. And that's what we're gonna do next week is look at these works, look at these, you know, if you think about the the way in which this path works that lead us to this life that is more abundant than we could ever ask or imagine. And so as we do this, as we kind of wrap up today, we've got a song called Brighter Than Apathy for you. We did this song uh, this past summer. I love this song. This song says, I want to live for something bigger than fear. I want to live for something bigger than apathy. I want to give my life to something that costs me. And and I love this anthem. And so as this song plays, I just encourage you to ask God's spirit, no matter where you are in your journey of faith, meditate on this question. What is God inviting you into today? What am I exploring? What am I understanding? What do I sense in my spirit God's saying to me? What is the new thing that God wants to do in me? And here's some real easy things this week. I hope that you sense God inviting you to read Matthew 5 through 7 this week. Just a little prep reading. 
It's not too long. It won't take you too long. If you don't have a Bible, if you're new to Bible study, just Google Matthew 5 through 7. I would maybe encourage you to Google with it the phrase New Living Translation because that'll give you a translation of the scriptures in a kind of a pretty easy to read and follow modern language. So maybe you'll read that this week. Maybe you feel an invitation to host a trunk at Oktoberfest. Now, like, this is what I mean by, like, everyday normal life. <laughs> Believe it or not, hosting a trunk is a peacemaking activity because it introduces people to the love of Jesus, one, can- one piece of candy at a time, right? I mean, it says there is a space for you. It says all kinds of things, but this is it. But we do it now out of a motivation, not because, oh, the pastor guilted me into it. I mean, I'll take that if that's what it takes, but that's just early Christianity, right? Let's move past that, you know? But it, it, it is actual peacemaking. These types of things, we give up of ourselves when we, when we take the time and, and we do things for like this idea of creating wholeness. We trust God to do that. And maybe you're interested in baptism. You want to explore this idea of baptism. You've never been baptized. Maybe you've been around for a while and you've heard it. You're like, well, what is that? Well, check the little box on the back of the Connect card or on the digital Connect card and just begin to say, well, what does that mean for me? What does that mean to die to self, Right? Let me pray for you. Enjoy this song. During the song, you can finish filling out that digital connect card, finish filling out your connect card here, um, get your offering ready, and then our hosts will be uh, back up and our anchors will be out to get us out of here. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you, Jesus, that uh, you've given us a a trail map called the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you for Matthew who kind of put it and compiled it together for us. Thank you that it is still changing lives. Open up our hearts to this reality, God. The justice, mercy, and humility are the cornerstone of what it means to be a disciple of the Prince of Peace, that this is the heart of love, to give ourselves away for justice, to give ourselves away in mercy, and to do it with you in your name because you've given it to us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy this song. Like I can't put a dent in this I stand on the edge of the abyss When hope in the dark seems foolish How are we ever gonna make it through this? I got one spot in the dimness One feels lit, it feels useless I lost on my own, I can't do this I'm just five blow, just two fish I got my microphone and my music This voice I own, I'm gonna use it One note at a time in a firefight Pushing back on the shadow in the twilight And the movement's unstoppable Got your soul, I got rock and roll. With a bar and soul, we don't stop before. Wake up, blue fire from the days of old. I wanna live for something bigger than me, stronger than fear, brighter than apathy. I Trading your caution for courage. Give me action, not your words. Once a spark catches a fire. One voice becomes a cry We are tired, you and I We're fragile, but we don't break We come together, we're mosaic We're brave for weather in the cold rain Thoughts and prayers are nice But they're mortified, give me bravery Give me sacrifice
Well, go ahead and take out your Connect card. If you're in the room with us, take out your paper Connect card online. You can go to your digital Connect card at crossroadscolorado.com slash gather. And it's time right now to receive our offering. And this is one of the things that we experience together each week. There are three ways for you to give. Number one, online at crossroadscolorado.com. Number two, you can text Crossroads to 77977. Or if you're in the room here, we have giving envelopes and Hope is Here orange boxes that you can drop in as well. And a way, if you haven't started yet, to start your giving process is by texting Crossroads to 77977. And when you do, one of the great things is it allows you an opportunity to automate your giving. And that's a way to stay consistent in our giving efforts. And one of the things that Ryan said early on is that Regardless of whether we're in person or online, Crossroads has never closed. And it's because of the faithful giving of all of you and automating is a way to do that. Yes, and also if you would like to give to the Fire Relief Fund, you can designate that on your giving envelope or on the digital giving page as well. Great. And one thing we'd like to be able to do for you is um, to pray with you. So if you have a prayer need, a couple ways you can do it. You can fill it out, like we mentioned, on the Connect card digitally or in person. Or you can simply text the word prayer to 970-500-90970 and we can pray that way. Or if you have in the room and you have a prayer need immediately, we have members of our prayer team that will be up front. Or if you're on our online campus, all you have to do is hit the prayer button and one of our hosts will be there to pray with you. Yes. And next week, oh no, this week, don't forget to pick up your candy for Oktoberfest. Yeah. So grab extra bags, bring them by the Taft Avenue location sometime Monday through Thursday between 10 and 3 is when the building is open, or you can still get on Amazon and have it shipped here. Yes, excellent. And let me walk us through what this week is going to look like, because we have a big week here at Crossroads. Obviously, it all starts on Thursday night as we continue on in this series, Hope is Open, and that's at 6.30 p.m. And I mention that because sometimes we go back and forth between Thursday and Sunday. Then on Saturday, it's the October Family Fest from 2 to 3.30 p.m. And when you come on that night, later on that night, be sure to turn your clocks back one hour as daylight savings ends. And reminder, on Sunday, yes. we start... Our two new services at 9 and 11 a.m. And if you don't turn your clocks back, you're going to be arriving somewhere in the middle. So be sure to uh, <laughs> turn your clocks back one hour on Sunday. Hey, and Rod, I also forgot to mention the kids cast too. So yes. if you have kids in the room, remember all materials go up live Thursday nights at 630. So if you've not accessed the curriculum of these videos that we produce each week and the materials, the supplemental materials, they're all available there for you to download and keep those kids connected with the team this week. And so online folks, stay safe and healthy out there as well as everybody in this room, of course, too. But as we exit, let's exit safely. Take our conversations out and stay the safe distance from one another. Um, we have a food truck here. That's so right. if you're here in the room, make lunch easier for you and grab some main lobster shack on your way out. And drop It'll off be these delicious. thank you cards. Oh, yes. And drop off the thank you cards for firefighters and those Hope is Here boxes. Great. Well, it was good to see you all. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.